And I would say, Lord, you know, if this crop gets wiped out by hail, which does happen from time to time, then you've got another plan for me because I've given you my life. I've given you the farm. I've given you my wife, my children, my business, my, my staff, my animals, and an absolute peace would come over me. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Have you ever had a moment where you had to find the courage to change your situation and start something totally new? Our guests this week can testify to how hard that can be, but can also report how leaning on God's strength to make a needed shift in life can net amazing rewards. South African farmer and evangelist Angus Buchan and author and pie shop owner Tara Royer Steele join the show this week to share their stories. Angus Buchan is a South African farmer who eventually became a full-time evangelist. Committed to hard work and hard living, he made a radical change by becoming a Christian, surprising friends and family with his newfound faith. That faith has sustained him through family tragedies and financial crisis. Feeling a burden for his community in South Africa, Angus felt called to share the faith he'd found on a larger platform. Still a farmer, he is now an international evangelist having traveled through Africa in a refitted yellow fire engine, telling people about Christ and filling the largest venues in South Africa. The stories of his spiritual adventures were detailed in the popular book and movie, Faith Like Potatoes, and now he shares how God is still working as he looks forward to celebrating 75 glorious years of life. My name is Angus Buchan, and I'm an evangelist stroke farmer, and we are farming in the Midlands of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. And I come from a, a Scottish background, My father and mother came out to South Africa and I was born out here. Uh, My dad was a a country blacksmith from the northeast of Scotland, the Aberdeenshire area. I am happily married to my best friend, Jill, my wife. We have five children, 11 grandchildren, um, (laughs) 27 adopted Zulu children. And I have 480 men that I'm mentoring. So you can call me Father Abraham if you like. (laughs) I was born in Zimbabwe, grew up in Zambia, just north of the Zambezi River. And as I say, come from a blue collar family. My dad was um, a wonderful man, one of my heroes. He really was big, strong man. And I had the privilege of actually leading him to Jesus much later on in life when he came to live with me on my farm in South Africa. And my mother was a bonny Scottish lass, and uh, she was a storyteller of note, just like Jesus was a storyteller, just telling hungry people where to find bread. My uh, upbringing in uh, Central Africa was very unique. I am an African through and through. I can speak uh, the Zulu language. In fact, I preach in the Zulu language. That's in South Africa, of course. But I did all my schooling in Central Africa. Then I went back to Bonnie, Scotland, where I did my agricultural training. And from there, as a wild colonial boy, I then went uh, to Australia, where they taught me to ride horses and lots of other things. (laughs) And uh, then eventually I, 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 I married and uh, then we, things got a bit rough in Central Africa. We packed up all our goods and chattels in a truck and trailer, came across the mighty Zambezi River on a pontoon in the middle of the Rhodesian Zambian Bush War. And we came down to South Africa and settled here via Swaziland. And we literally started with nothing. I fed the hogs and I cut the firewood and I built my house out of wattle and daub and uh, we had a wonderful time together. On the 18th of February, 1979, uh, a young farmer who had literally worked himself to a standstill. I I was working seven days a week. You know, I had five young children and a young wife. And I was trying to learn to speak the local language, Zulu. 
and I didn't have any friends, not many neighbors. And uh, the only thing we did was work. Jill, my beautiful wife, said to me, Angus, you can't go on like this. And she persuaded me to go to a little church in the main street of the town, which is close to the farm. It's about maybe seven or eight miles away. I'll never forget it. It was a Sunday morning. It was nine o'clock. There were, the preacher was not preaching that day. And men were getting up and women and giving their testimonies, you know, building contractors, housewives, sportsmen. And I sat there and I saw these men and these women, they were weeping. You know, my business was going bankrupt. My marriage was finished. I had had, I had terminal cancer and Jesus healed me. And I sat there with my mouth open. And then right at the end, one of the laymen said, if you want Jesus to be your savior, we want you to come forward now. And I, I stood up, me, Jill, and all our children, just like a, a gander, a goose, and all the goslings. And we walked straight to the front with lots of other people. And that was the defining moment of my life. I have never been the same since. I didn't see any visions. I never heard any bells, no lightning. But I knew in my heart that Jesus Christ was now the general manager of my life, my farm, my family. And that was the beginning of the beginning. I, I, I couldn't contain myself. I was so overwhelmed. My sins were forgiven. I was a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You know, I was going one way and then the Lord knocked me off my horse and my life has never, ever been the same again. Look, I've had some tragedies, as you probably know, like all of us, but miracles have taken place. Nobody will ever persuade me that Jesus Christ is not alive and the Son of God. Never. My theological training college was on the farm. You know, we literally cleared this farm by hand. I didn't even have enough money for a chainsaw. I had to clear the farm with a long-handled axe, just like Abraham Lincoln. I don't say I split the, the trees quite as quickly as he did, but uh, we gave it a good go. And then, of course, one of my best friends was my foreman, a Zulu, Simeon Bengu. Together, we cut this bush down and turned this into a beautiful farm as it is today. Uh, I came here with one tractor. Then I managed to get another tractor, and that was about it. I was surrounded by big forests, commercial forests that grow pine trees. And the one year, a fire broke out on my farm. And if that fire had jumped the fence into the neighbors, which was a big timber company, they would have taken me to the cleaners. I would have left the farm with my shirt on my back, that's all. This fire was raging, and it was out of the rainy season. Okay, there wasn't a cloud in the sky, even the size of a man's fist. And all the farmers, like they always do, they gathered around to come and help me. And they were trying to hold this fire at bay. And they could not put it out. It was too intense. We couldn't get within like 20 feet of it. And by 11 o'clock in the day, the farmers started coming to me and saying, Listen, Angus, we're very sorry, but we've got to go now. We've got to pay wages because tomorrow is a public holiday. It's Easter. And I understood that. And I didn't know what to do. And I had one of my Zulu drivers next to me. His name was Le Zondi. I said to him, Le, I'm going to pray. I said this in Zulu. I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask God to send rain to put the fire out. And so I got on my knees in the dust. And the farmers standing around must have thought that I'd lost, you know, gone mad. And I started to pray. I prayed, Lord, I'm your son. You've told me to cast my cares upon you. And I'm doing it, Lord. I need rain to put this fire out. Lord Jesus, if this fire jumps across the fence, I'm finished. I'm ruined. Okay? And I got up. And I'm telling you, God is my witness. I don't tell lies anymore. I'm a Christian now. There was a shot of lightning came out of a clear sky. And about two minutes later, a, 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 a sound of thunder. 
like I've never heard before. And the north wind stopped, it turned around and the wind started blowing from the south and gentle rain came up. Now that is God's honest truth. You know, that driver of mine, <laughs> that Zulu driver, his eyes were like saucers, you know. He couldn't believe it. Look, my legs were shaking like jelly. And the farmers came up and you know what they said, uh, Angus, you know, you're very lucky. I don't know where the rain's come from, but all the best and we'll see you later. And this is how my spiritual walk started with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a lot of these men that were driving around in their pickups were farmers who knew me before. And they knew me to be a hard drinking, hard fighting, you know, man about, about the place. And they could not believe that I was still the same person. I had a complete transformation. I had joy, I had peace, and I was ready for whatever God told me to do. And you know, the one day I said to Jill, I said, because I was a new Christian, I didn't understand how it happened. I wanted to be a preacher. So I thought what I must do is I must give my farm away, not sell it, give it away, go to Bible college, study to be a pastor, and then become a pastor. That's how naive I was, okay? And I looked at Jill, and she was so happy. She wasn't worried or concerned. I don't know how you'd feel if your husband said, we're coming home, and I'm going to give the house away and the farm, and we're going to go by faith to Bible college. And I said, Jill, God has given me the answer. And she said to me, I know. I said, how do you know? He says, she said, because he's told me as well. Isn't that so beautiful? So we went into the bedroom. We sat down. I opened up the Bible, 2 Corinthians 9, 8. She opened up her Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. You know, my legs went to jelly again. She never knew that I was reading the book, uh, 2 Corinthians. I didn't know what she was reading, and God confirmed it, that we are to stay on this farm, that we are to make, it's called Shalom, by the way. We called it Shalom. Stay on this farm and make a place for our Holy Spirit to move. We built a little chapel. It's a thatched chapel. It can seat about 100 people. Since then, we've built what we call the tabernacle. It can seat 500. But then God told me to mentor men, and I thought three or four men. I can tell you, I can show you photographs. We had in 2010, some say 400, some say 450,000 men on this farm. Now, this is the God that I'm wanting to tell you about. This is the God that has changed my life. You know, when I was a little boy, I couldn't speak to more than two people. If I saw a girl, I'd run a mile. <laughs> what has happened? The Holy Spirit has taken over. We have got now Mighty Men conferences all over the world. So we have been subjected to many, many tests. I've had floods. I've had, I've had droughts. I've had fires. I've told you just about one. But probably the hardest test of my life, about 44 years ago, I can remember it like it was yesterday, my brother's youngest son, my brother was down on the farm. He's a golf professional. And he was playing, playing cricket with the kids on the, on the lawn. And I was sitting there having a cup of tea, watching everything. And one of my tractor drivers came to me and said, there's a tractor which is stuck in the field. Could you please come and help us to pull it out? I said, no problem. I was gonna get on the other tractor with a chain and go and pull it out. As I was walking up the path, my little nephew, his name is Alistair, four years old, blonde hair, blue eyes. I was his favorite uncle, and his favorite tractor was the green John Deere tractor. And he said to me, he called me Auntie Angus. But that's what he called me, Auntie Angus. Auntie Angus, where are you going? I said, I'm going to drive the tractor, Alistair. He said, can I come? Please, four years old. I said to him, go and ask your daddy first. And of course, my brother, who's two years younger than me, said, of course, he can go with you. He was standing on the running board next to me. His sister was on the other side. The driver was standing behind me. We went around a corner. I'll never know. Jesus will tell me one day. And the little boy fell forward. 
off the tractor onto the ground and the tractor rolled over him and killed him. At that moment, a neighbor arrived in a pickup and I asked him to take me to the hospital. When we got to the hospital, the doctor said, the little boy is dead. At that moment, my brother walked up the steps of that hospital. You know, I always looked after my brother at school. I was always the oldest one, even though he's bigger than me. And I saw that little boy again, you know, with his hands outstretched, Angus, Angus, where's my son? And I had to say to him, your son is with Jesus. And uh, at that moment, I knew, God, if you don't help me now, I'm going to go mad. And um, he's never held it against me. He's now preaching the gospel himself. Can you believe that? And his other son is also a preacher in Boston, USA. And uh, I had to work through that one. You know, I, I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep for more than six days. But Jesus, slowly but surely, he restored me. And I can honestly tell you that the Lord saw me through. And you know, if there's anybody listening to this program who's had those accidents, because many people have been to see me, a lot of them farmers actually, who have had similar accidents. I, I tell them straight, you'll never get over it. You'll learn to live with it. And um, I know that Alistair is in heaven. I know he's waiting for me. And I know that when I die, he'll be there at the pearly gates, standing next to Jesus. And he'll say probably something like, Auntie Angus, <laughs> what's taking you so long? You know? And that's why I'm preaching. I'm, I'm preaching until the day I die. You know that beautiful uh, song? I think Randy Travis sings it. And there's a few others of your beautiful singers. You know, that, uh, that gospel train, that revival train. Well, God's given me a vision, and I've already been down to Cape Town, which is the southern point of our continent, and I think I've found the train, a complete train. And what we're going to do early next year, can you imagine us steaming into a town and all aboard and everybody off board and into the streets, into the hospitals, the schools, into the workplaces, telling people about Jesus, praying for the sick, giving them follow-up material, then coming together in the evening at the station where I will speak. We'll have one flatbed carriage that will have a permanent sound system, floodlights, speakers, the lot, top bands. And we are going to flood this beloved country of South Africa. We're going to preach the undiluted gospel of Jesus Christ. That, that is what I'm praying for right at this very moment. To learn more about Angus Buchan's ministry in South Africa, visit angusbuchan.co.za. Stay tuned to Tara Royer Steele's story after this brief message. 2020 has brought a lot of challenges to many of our lives, but none more than our country's first responders. The team at Jesus Calling has chosen 100 Jesus Calling devotions that have been specially selected for those heroes in our midst. There are hardcover editions of these 100 devotions for medical professionals, firefighters, law enforcement, and the armed forces. Find these Jesus Calling for First Responders editions exclusively at christianbook.com. Our next guest is Tara Royer Steele of the Pie Haven in Round Top, Texas. Growing up, Tara worked hard to help her family run their business, but the love she craved and the affirmation she sought went deeper than her achievements in the family business. And as a young woman, Tara entered into an unhealthy marriage. She grappled with the ongoing abuse from her husband and the belief that she didn't deserve anything better until she felt the Spirit of God offering her a chance for a life free of the cruel situation in her marriage. Making the break was tough, but Tara went on to rebuild and eventually met and married the man who would walk with her to reach her dream of creating her own special place for people to come and connect over tables, a haven for conversation and community over each slice of pie. My name's Tara Royer Steele, and um, I live in Brenham, Texas, which is smack dab in the middle of Houston and Austin. And I grew up in a tiny town called Round Top, Texas, which a lot of people know because of antiques. Um, but I grew up in our family business um, of pie. And I have a pie shop with my husband. And we also have um, 
our commercial kitchen, which helps bake all the pies for our other businesses. Oh, I have two cute boys, <laughs> Brayden and Bentley. And we just love to create spaces for people to come and gather and create safe havens for people. So when I, we took over um, this cafe in Round Top, Texas, it was my parents. We, I have three younger brothers and, you know, um, it was a huge leap of faith. My dad had been out of work for years and we really did not even have the gas money to get to Round Top. And so my dad had been in the restaurant business, but he had never run a restaurant business. And we also knew nothing about pies, but the cafe came with, came with two pies. And um, so they really dug in and said, I'm like, we have to do this. Like God has given us this gift. We have taken this leap of faith. So um, let's use the knowledge that we have and the gifts that have been given in this joint and make it work. And so like really, as they say, um, you know, the rest is history because my dad just started and my mom, she was in the kitchen and my dad was actually out front. He's always said, we're not in the food business. We're in the marketing business. We're in the relationship business. So the cafe became that, um, a, a relational restaurant and people that walked through the door felt safe and welcomed and loved and seen. And then it grew and two pies became five pies and 16 pies. And before you know it, it's on TV and in the magazines, but my parents not you know, having all the skills, of course, they were doing the best that they could at the time. You know, there were financial difficulties. Of course, we also came from not having any money whatsoever. And so, of course, there was a lot of strain on our family to perform. And, you know, I, I lived in this fear of my father and I just wanted to please him. So I did whatever I needed to do to help. And, of course, it caused us to just have this relationship that was business. And there was no father-daughter relationship, which I always craved. But I also had no idea what it really looked like to be loved from the father. So I wasn't getting it from anywhere, but I was doing whatever I could so I could get something from my dad and to make him happy. So um, the pressures of running a family business and then in a town of 90 people, and then it grew quickly in popularity, put a lot of strain on our family, but it also was so good and brought so many relationships and relationships that over 30 years are still deeply rooted and there. And it has honestly, though, the restaurant at times was strife. But what it has done is kept our family together um, and not divided us, which so many family businesses can do. And that there is no way that I would be sitting here right now if God hadn't protected and provided through that whole season. And it was a long season, about a good 18 years <laughs> of running the restaurant. Tara's deep-seated need for love and approval unfortunately led to a marriage that wasn't healthy. Tara shares how she found the courage to confront the abuse in her first marriage and how her healing really began when she accepted God's invitation to experience the good He had in store for her life. Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> he um, was abusive, and that was not even the last straw for me. And I had opportunity after opportunity to walk away. But I was stuck in that same cycle of needing someone to love me and approval. And so I was the girl that was not always the skinny girl. And so I just wanted someone to love me, but he didn't love me. And I had to learn that, you know, God's had to grab me and say, listen, this is your last chance. Um, I love you. I see you. I am enough for you. I didn't have a choice. There were no other options for me. So I just had to walk in that. And of course, then we got divorced and I had been the, you know, take the keys away girl, the make sure everyone's safe girl. And now I was like, I don't care about any of y'all. I am going to party like a rock star now. And I'm going to be the one that goes and 
drinks and has fun. And I mean, grace of God that, you know, I can sit here and be like talking here. Um, I don't know how I made it home many nights. And so I, once again, was searching and looking for attention. And I, I was the one that, hey, call Tara. Like, she'll go out. She's fun. She's the fun girl. She'll buy all our drinks. And, and, and still, though, of course, that just numbed everything. Nothing, nothing was repaired or resolved. The wounds and the pain just kept getting deeper and deeper. And so it eventually had to come to a point where I had to do something about it. This is the craziest thing. Like, it was once again God saying, listen, I have really good stuff for you. Can you, will you trust me and quit trying to please everybody and quit trying to make friends and just trust me? But I just saw all the ick and none of the good, none of the blessings. I remember conversations of driving like with a friend going, it would just be easier if I just ended my life right now. I have nothing. Which was such a lie that I believed because I had so much. I did have amazing relationships. I had a family. I had a great job. I had amazing opportunities. So um, I was in a pretty deep pit. And it's, It's not crazy that God used Match.com to introduce me to my husband who had been in silence for a year because of his previous marriage, just talking to God and growing. He grew up in the faith, but he didn't know. And I, too, grew up in all of it. And I knew, but I didn't know the goodness of God and what he had for me. And he put us together and and he wanted to, I mean, we got married real quickly because we both knew like, oh my gosh, I, I, this, I know what I don't want. And this is exactly what I want. He is such a gift from God. And we've been working together for 15 years and, you know, through it, we have gotten to do amazing things and grow our businesses and dream together. And the dreams that God had laid on my heart when I was a little girl and dreams that he's dreamed of, we're getting to do together. So it's just been, um, it's such a sweet thing to be able to walk, walk it all out. Like I don't remember so much of my past, but man, I would do it all over again to be where I am right now. You know, the cafe was a family thing and I got to put a little bit of my spin on it, but it was still, everyone had their opinions and everyone had their thoughts. And so it wasn't a place where I got to just truly dream and do whatever, like God laid an idea, God gave me this creative thought. Well, how can I go do that spin? So an opportunity happened Uh, came about where we could open this pie shop across the street like in a town of 90 people yes across the street another pie shop and um it was an overflow because people would come to eat at the cafe and we have no seating for them if they just wanted pie so like it became an opportunity but it was i never got to be there rick never was there we just had our finger on it and so we created this space though where we didn't have to be there because if you walk into the cafe, you would always have seen my dad on the front porch, JB, my brother, waiting on you, Todd, my brother, waiting on you, my brother, Micah, Rick and I in the kitchen. So you saw us and you expected it and the customer came to know that. And the Pie Haven was not that. You walked in and it was this sensory overload of wonderful pies and wonderful smells and, um, you know, this old little house with a big oak tree and chairs outside and words of inspiration I literally just wrote all over the walls Um, so it really became a haven not having a clue when we named it Royer's Pie Haven that that's what it was going to be and I, I really am loving that because, you know, if someone asked me, what's your business plan? I was like, well, God's my business plan. I did not go to school. I have no degrees. The only degree is one my mom and dad gave me and it's hanging on the wall. And so, uh, you know, I went to the school of life. But what I do know from the school of life is that customers, especially these days, want to come to a place where they know that it's, it is safe and that they are seen and that they are loved. And that there's room for them at all the tables. So then you get to strike up conversations with people and build 
relationships with people over pie, everyone's favorite and maybe mine is the sweet and salty, which is like this dense fudgy brownie with caramels and sea salt. And then another fave is the junk berry, which is apples and peaches and blackberries and raspberries and blueberries with the sour cream topping. And so, I mean, eating food together is a common thing that we all have together. I just um, am super grateful for the customers who have been so kind to us because we would not have this tribe of people, this community, if it wasn't for Pi. So many things in life, like our, the ingredients in our life are just like the fruits of the spirit, right? Like, are you pouring in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control? Are you pouring all those ingredients into your pie? Are you, as you're molding and shaping your children like a pie crust, are you coming alongside them and crimping it with grace and mercy and forgiveness and love? Just like if Jesus was standing right next to you and he was walking you through I bought the Jesus Calling book forever ago. I bought it for my kids, Jesus Calling for my kids. I read it with my kids. What I I love about it, it truly is that, you know, you can just flip the switch real easy in that book and that devotion and put your name there and read the words and know that Jesus is speaking to you. So I love the words. They are full of truth and full of life and full of hope. I'm a routine girl and I love to get up in the morning and I grind my coffee. I make 12 cups. I don't drink it all by myself. I always have to have music playing in the background. My favorites right now are Maverick City. And and I so I have that going. Coffee's brewing. And I have my Bible and a devotional. And it is so important for me to have that time in the morning to be intentional about the day. I really believe that it, you know, if we're not jumping out of bed and racing and we've created that time, then, I mean, it really does. It sets our days. So I think it's very key to our daily walk. Jesus Calling, March 23rd. I am a God of both intricate detail and overflowing abundance. When you entrust the details of your life to me, You are surprised by how thoroughly I answer your petitions. I take pleasure in hearing your prayers, so feel free to bring me all your requests. The more you pray, the more answers you can receive. Best of all, your faith is strengthened as you see how precisely I respond to your specific prayers. Because I am infinite in all my ways, you need not fear that I will run out of resources. Abundance is at the very heart of who I am. Come to me in joyful expectation of receiving all you need and sometimes much more. I delight in sharing blessings on my beloved children. Come to me with open hands and heart, ready to receive all I have for you. Are you truly seeing that and stopping and noticing that he's right there and going, Hey guys, like let's love each other and let's put lasting crimps on our lives, on our relationships, on our kids' lives of grace and love and kindness and mercy and goodness and faithfulness. And it is not easy. (laughs) I mean, I'm sitting there talking about this going, well, you better do that today, sister. I know you have lots of conversations you get to have today, and I sure hope you do all those things because it's so easy for us in a world now where we quickly react and we don't step back and truly savor the moments um, that we have and these opportunities that we have to meet people exactly where they are and be the hands and feet of Jesus. To learn more about Tara's new devotional, Eat, Pie, Love, visit tararoyersteel.com. If you'd like to hear more stories about courage to change our circumstances, listen to our interview with Auntie Ann Byler. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we talk with beloved NFL Super Bowl winning coach and commentator Tony Dungy. The coach shares how he learned early on as a player how all-consuming pro football life could be and the impact it could have on his life and family. 
and the wise words he received from his first coach in the NFL, Coach Chuck Knoll. If you make football your life, you're going to leave the game disappointed. And I remember I was writing that down and saying, wait a minute, this sounds like my mother. And it, it hit home to me uh, that here was this man that had won two Super Bowls already, and he was saying, don't make football your whole life. Want to hear more inspirational stories of people who have been changed by a closer walk with God? Then subscribe today to the Jesus Calling Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please be sure to leave a review, which helps us reach and inspire others with these stories. Plus, if you like seeing our guests as well as hearing them, you can find video interviews available on our YouTube channel at youtube.com, Jesus Calling Book, on Facebook, and on the Jesus Calling Instagram page.